Our New Testament lesson comes from Matthew's Gospel, and following on the heels of the section that we call the Beatitudes, beginning in chapter 5, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I hate the Enneagram. Make sure I'm saying that right. Enneagram. Okay, thanks, Kelsey. I hate the Enneagram. Now, I, that little bit of an exaggeration is kind of an overstatement because honestly, I don't know much at all about the Enneagram. <laughs> but I hate it nevertheless uh, <laughs> because it is a personality test as I understand it and it gives you a couple of numbers which are supposed to define you and determine and say who you are and that's the kind of thing that I just can't stand so what personality type does that make me arrogant judgmental I'm sure that they have a a number for it so in principle here I'm just speaking on principle I don't like it I've never liked the idea of test that purport to define who you are. I didn't like the Myers-Briggs personality test and the four letters it tried to label we with, N-E-R-D. I don't know where they got those letters from, but nevertheless, I didn't like it then either. (laughs) I'm sure that my dislike is consistent with whatever personality it will tell me I'd have, but I didn't like the Strong Campbell personality inventory either. When I had to take that at the beginning of seminary, And after completing the test, it declared that this is the little box over here on the far left-hand bottom corner that describes you. You might really think about becoming an auto mechanic. (laughs) And the test administrator looked at me like, are you sure you're in the right place? I can't stand being pigeonholed, unless I like the hole, that you're trying to put me in. A career counselor once read all my various psychological tests and said to me, you're the sort of person who secretly wants to jump right into the middle of a puddle, but instead you walk carefully around it. Hmm. Now I've thought about this for a long time. I even told Helen about it a long time ago when, you know, in a spontaneous moment I was being honest about myself. I told her about it. And that was a big mistake. (laughs) Because every so often when I'm frustrated or when I'm trying to decide something, this is what I'll hear. Why don't you just jump in the puddle? You know that's what you really want to do. Go ahead and jump in the puddle. And when I hear that, I immediately want to say, I'm not a person who likes to jump in puddles. Don't pigeonhole me that way. Not that kind of personality, I don't think. Maybe. Well... I don't know. What does being a puddle jumper have to do with any of this anyhow? But Jesus seems pretty definite. He seems pretty certain. He seems pretty forceful when he says, 
You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You don't need a standardized, multiple choice test to tell you. This is a designation that Jesus is making about you. And Jesus isn't talking about a few select, uniquely qualified or gifted people. He isn't picking out individuals in the crowd. He's not saying, you sitting in the back row in the corner over there, you're the light of the world. And he isn't saying, you sitting right here in the front row, you're the salt of the earth. Everyone, everyone here this morning, no matter how boldly or how hesitantly you may call yourself a Christian, Jesus says, you are salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. In some ways, it seems to me, this identification process began, according to Matthew, the moment Jesus walked into Capernaum at the start of his ministry. At that point, Matthew says, Isaiah's prophecy is fulfilled on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of Galilee, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and those who sat in the region and shadow of death light has dawned. The beginning of Jesus' ministry brings light in the midst of darkness. Jesus brings light to those who hear him, see him, and interact with him. Jesus sums up this new reality that his light reveals when he proclaims, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. We'll wait just a second as we... (laughs) Thanks to Judge and Helen as they try to help this individual. Talking about Jesus telling you, even as you watch stuff going on around you, (laughs) Jesus telling you, you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And how that's something that just seems to be central to the very beginning of his ministry. He starts and he calls disciples, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, follow me and I will make you fish for people. Jesus begins to draw to himself those whose lives are now illumined and shaped by the light of his life. You are fishers of people. Jesus' teachings and healings begin to draw crowds to him from all around Galilee and Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and beyond the Jordan. In other words, all sorts of people come from everywhere, to see and hear and be healed by Jesus. And Matthew says that when he sees these crowds, Jesus goes up on the side of a mountain, sits down, his disciples come to him, and he begins to teach them. Maybe we would even say that at this point, Jesus is beginning to enlighten them. The setting on the mountainside and the scene of all those people gathered to listen to Jesus suggests the image itself of a light elevated and shining brightly for all to see. And his words illuminate how life is now to be seen in this new light. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. The light begins to show more and more and more. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The light begins to even fall on those who are gathered. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who went before you. 
Now, we call this section of Matthew's gospel, which you probably know so well, this first section of a larger group of Jesus' teachings, we call this the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew doesn't call it the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew just says that Jesus went up on a mountain, sat down, and began to speak and to teach to the people who came to him. Jesus himself doesn't call it a sermon. Jesus doesn't say, now everybody sit down. I'm going now to preach to you my very first sermon. And there are no bulletins circulating in the crowd that say in it, sermon, sermon on the mount by Jesus. It isn't. It isn't just a general speech about the nature of life. No one gets up and says, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. His name is Jesus. He's recently come to us from Capernaum and from his hometown of Nazareth. And his topic today is, is there anything really new under the sun? Or have you ever seen that happen in church before? Whatever the topic might be. When Jesus sees the crowd, goes up on the mountain and sits down and begins to teach them, It's clearly the posture of a rabbi, a teacher, a leader, instructing his followers. This is Introduction to Discipleship 101. This is a prerequisite for everything else that follows. Jesus begins this class with a critical description of the life and character of discipleship. If you're going to follow Jesus, if you're going to enroll in this school, you have to have a clear understanding of the vision, mission, and core values that will guide everything else. If you're going to be a part of all this, then the shape and form of this life, his life, is going to give shape and form to your life. You are now called to and exhibit in your life the poverty of spirit that engenders humility and gratitude, the longing for wholeness and healing that is known by those who mourn. You are going to exhibit in your life the meekness that refuses to impose self over others. You are going to show forth in your life the passion for righteousness that challenges injustice, the acts of mercy that embody compassion. You are going to experience in your life and exhibit through your life the purity of heart that serves truth, the faithfulness that risks hostility. Jesus says to you and all those gathered, blessed are those God favors those who follow in this way Jesus does not hesitate to tell us who we are and what we are called to do as his disciples you are the salt of the earth you are to season and preserve life around you by living the way of life that I hold before you And if you're not living in a way that brings God's call to righteousness and justice to bear on the brokenness and injustice of life around you, then in effect, you're useless. You've lost your purpose. You might as well be tossed out into the street and mixed in with the rest of the dirt and dust of the world. Jesus says you are the light of the world. Your life must reflect the light of my life. If your life doesn't bring any light into some place, some corner, some room of darkness, then why do you think you understand my life at all? Do you take my life and my light and put it under a trash can? Let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Let others see how my life enlightens your life so that they can know the wonder and the truth of God's light. And then he goes on to say, now remember, class, remember, friends, remember, disciples, this isn't supposed to be about anyone making a fuss over you. I'm not calling you to live in a way that makes you the center of attention, that puts you on a pedestal, that suggests you are superior to anyone else. I call on you to follow me so that God's light can shine in the world. I call you to live in a manner that opens the way for others to be blessed by God's light and God's love. This isn't about how you are going to be seen and admired by everyone else at all. 
This year, missed all my Christmas lights. I spent a few extra dollars and bought two little strings of solar-powered lights. They're called little fairy lights. And I had so much fun putting those little solar-powered lights around the little library that Helen got from Sticks and it installed in the side of our yards and in a little bush in the front. And it's been the most amazing thing. They're solar-powered lights, so once they were put in, I didn't have anything else to do with it. The sun recharged them by day, and then at night they would start to sparkle and blinkle and twinkle all night long, unless it was cloudy, and then they just were dim throughout the evening. Well, of course, the time came along, and I took down all the other Christmas lights that have been around our house for the season, but I have not been able to take down those little delightful solar lights. There's something about the sense that there's a light shining through them that isn't about me at all, but that comes from a greater source that has its own ability to illumine and bring joy to the world around it. I'm sure my neighbors are talking about me. You can ask Clay and Gail, they're here this morning. But <laughs> there's something about that light which doesn't draw attention to me, it seems, but helps me to see a source of energy and power that comes from somewhere else. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine so that others may see your good works and give glory to my Father in heaven. Your life is to be an opening for others to see God's love and God's grace and God's goodness. Maybe that's something we need to hear for ourselves before we hear anything else. I mean, maybe it's something we need to hear about ourselves. There may be circumstances in our own lives where we feel listless and helpless and without a sense of direction or purpose. And to call the follow him, Jesus empowers us with the force of God's will for our life, God's intention to renew and transform us according to the pattern of life that Jesus sets before it. You may not feel like it, but Jesus says, this is who I am telling you, you are. You are the salt of the earth. God has blessed you with what is necessary to bring zest and joy and goodness to the world. There may be places in our lives where we feel defeated and diminished by different experiences of darkness the emptiness of grief, the isolation of failure, the uncertainty of unexpected twists and turns that life can take, the regret of missed chances and opportunities. In the call to follow him, Jesus shines the light of his life into the darkness that confronts us and illumines a new way through him. You are the light of the world. You can be bearers of Christ's light and Christ's life because it has been given to you. When we hear Jesus say this to us and about us, it's also certainly what Jesus is calling us and enabling us to be in and for the world as we follow him. Be light, be salt, so that others may see and experience God's goodness and power and love. God's grace to us always flows outward to others. This is the very nature of God. God is always pushing forward to make present his will and expand his purpose for all of life and for the whole world. And you are riding that wave of what God is doing in the world. You are the salt. You are the light. And from time to time, you just need someone else to tell you that's who you are. It begins with Jesus. But then from time to time, we hear other people. Like those times when we have a mission fair and we have people from the community come and visit with us and they begin to remind us, even in the midst of that activity, who we are. For example, many years ago, Marvin Hardy, the founder of Grace Medical Ohm, was here and so was his uncle 
And his father may have been with him as well. And his, his uncle, I believe it was, got up and said to us as we were gathered over there in the fellowship hall, you know Park Lake? Park Lake, I've lived here all my life. I've been a Baptist all my life. But I've known about you all my life. And the good works that you do here in Orlando. And for all my life, the side of that tower there on the corner of Colonial and Highland has been a beacon of light to me and to so many others. You should remember that, he said to us gathered there. You should hear the call again to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Those blessing bags that your youth put together, sprinkling help and grace and compassion to those who need it. Those new ideas that you come up with of raising money to help pay for the bond of people who can't afford it, but yet sit in prison, reminding you of the prophecy of Isaiah, where God says, I have set my light in your midst to bring light to those who sit in the prison of darkness. Remember, you are the light of the world. Remember that place where people who can't get medical care can go to because you, you raise funds for it a little bit each year in your mission fair. This place called a home with the adjective of grace Grace, medical home, you are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. Remember, that's who you are. Remember, that's what you're doing. Remember, that's what I'm telling you about yourself, calling you to be. Remember, you're the people who think Madagascar needs more mango trees. And you've sent somebody over there that can help them to graft new mango trees and restore their landscape and prevent the deterioration that's taking place. Remember, you have supported a woman who's working with youth there and teaching them to talk to each other so that they can handle the poverty and the hostility that they face daily. Remember that you sprinkle a little salt here and the wind carries it all the way across the world to another country. Remember that you light a little candle with children here on the steps and there are children on the other side of the world who begin to see it too. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Sometimes you just need to be told that, to be reminded of that, and to hear again the words of the one who is speaking, and to feel again in your own hearts the gift of his love, and to see your life again in his life. It's okay, it's okay, it's good when Jesus tells you this is who you are because he makes it so. Amen.